your garden could be a haven for bees, bugs, butterflies, and birds. And there are other things beyond plants and flowers that encourage and protect pollinators. It's a pollination ovation coming up on this special edition of Great Gardening, straight ahead. We grow a lot of carrots. People don't realize they can grow mountain laurel here. A lot of gardeners treat their gardens like art projects. We rely on bees for the food that we eat. Well, its common name is Angel's Trumpet. Gardening is definitely my quiet, quiet time. Hello and welcome to this 90 minute special edition of Great Gardening on pollinators and pollinator friendly landscapes. I'm Pamela Fish and I'm joined by two area experts, horticulturist and educator Bob Olin and garden professional Deb Burns Erickson. Well, it, it really is prime time to talk pollinators as uh, they are out feasting right now. They are, they are. they're yeah. moving around. I think we've started our gardening season. Finally. I think you are right. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep. Everybody's moving around, uh, uh, not just the birds and the bees and the butterflies, but you guys too, right? <laughs> yeah, we're busy. Lots, mm -hmm. lots going on right now. And, uh, you know, soil temperatures have warmed up. We had a couple of cool nights there, which I guess uh, you can expect, but uh, yeah. we're well on our way and off to a good start. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, our phone volunteers are the Carleton County Master Gardeners. They are standing by to take your questions and your pledge of support if you can contribute during this member drive and maybe even come along on our annual garden bus tour. It's one of our most popular thank you gifts. But please call those phone volunteers with your garden queries. Uh, the number's there on your screen. We have a local number, 788-2844. You can call toll free, 877-307-8762. You can even email your questions to askgardening at wdse.org. Well, we want to begin with our signs of the season, and we have this video that was shot by photographer A.J. Larson of some of the many spring blooms that we're now seeing. There's some lamium blooming mm -hmm. already, mm -hmm. and uh, I think these were taken in Inger Park or somewhere near there, and uh, lots of stuff coming out. The bleeding heart, of Beautiful. course, always Beautiful. gorgeous this time of year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's... Double plum. Yeah, double plum, plum. flowering. A double plum flowering. flowering. flowering, flowering uh, mm -hmm. almond, almond, I'll call yep. it. Oh, yeah. wow, okay. Mm -hmm. And those blooms are, mm -hmm. a lot Zalea of the trees are all, yeah. all bloomed out. Yeah, it and- Doesn't take long. No, it doesn't. Okay, well, these <laughs> pictures are- <laughs> Just from, the opposite, signs yeah. of the season, though. Yeah, these, mm -hmm. these came from you, Bob, and just tell us a little bit about what happened earlier this week. Well, we had- two nights over the weekend and a lot of people just assume that our season is getting longer it is getting a little warmer but that doesn't mean that we're not vulnerable to cold conditions so we didn't freeze but we had temperatures down there in the upper 30s lower 40s and we had a lot of people that experienced this they'd already set tomatoes and other warm season crops out and we just mm -hmm. bleached out all the chlorophyll wow. and i had so many people ask about what was the virus on all the tomatoes mm -hmm. and when i searched on the internet that was their explanation okay. mm -hmm. now these onions you said though will be fine Onions, they're cool season crop, they'll take it right down, if the roots are established, right down into the lower 20s, okay. uh, no mm -hmm. problem But at I all. think we have a look at another one that uh, really, really doesn't look very good, but you say it's going to be okay. Yeah, the, mm -hmm. anything this warm season, this is a cucumber yeah. that what germinated in the warmer soils, jumped out, but once again, that's just cold shock or cold shock in an evening followed by bright sun the next day. But look at the growing tip. That's what's important there. If the growing tip is green, right in the middle. you're going to be mm -hmm. fine. Mm -hmm. This kale. is kale. And once again, kale will just tolerate uh, all kinds of cold temperatures mm -hmm. up to a point. Uh, not quite as frost tolerant as uh, the garlic or the onion family, but nonetheless, it'll take uh, freezing temperatures Absolutely. for sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that's great information. and then good for people who, who saw that and really didn't know what the heck was going you know, on. Pam, we got fooled because we're aware that the season is being extended maybe eight or nine days, but that could all come at the end of the year mm -hmm. or we could split it and be maybe three or four days sure. earlier. We always says June 10th was mm -hmm. our first frost free did. date. Now mm -hmm. we might move it up a little bit, but not okay. nine days. Mm -mm. So I think now uh, about the 6th of June, we're about ready to go right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Well, one of our most beloved pollinating insects is the monarch butterfly. Across the region and the continent, you'll find monarch way stations set up in gardens large and small. And many gardeners, aiming to keep the population up, have taken to raising monarchs at home.
This is a real popular tall verbena. It's an annual. Um, the butterflies and bees love this. And then I have a pestamen in the middle. I have some lantana down below. And then this is the milkweed. I've had a lot of monarchs feeding on different plants, like the bee balm and the estrantia, and even on the milkweed. I'm Joan Sonoka, and this is my pollinator garden. Our daughter studied monarchs in her fourth, fifth grade split class and asked if I would start a butterfly garden. So I did the following spring and sure enough, we had monarchs that summer. Off she goes. This year we've had so many that I've, I've, I've got one cage with just uh, a, a, a plant with eggs on it. I have one with little micro caterpillars medium-sized caterpillars, and then when they get big, I separate them out because they're gonna be the ones to start climbing. So we have three cages going this year. They climb to the top, and then they kind of hang out for a couple of days, and then they start hanging like a J, in the shape of a J. And then they, they hang up there, and then all of a sudden, boom, they'll go, they'll transform into a chrysalis. And then it's about 10 to 12 days, I think before they emerge as a butterfly. When it turns black, that's when they're gonna pop out. You can see through it though. Um, it's like transparent, you can see the wings inside. They're very messy, <laughs> um, but they're fun to watch. And then my husband loves to photograph them and do time-lapse recordings of them, so. We combine my love of gardening and his love of photography. When we first started eight years ago, it was one or two. Just this year, it's 36 so far. Only 10% of the caterpillars or the eggs survive out outside. So there's spiders, wasps, flies that get to them. They have a better chance inside. I think we've lost 12 out of 36 that have hatched so far. And I've got another, what, 20 to go? 25, maybe? <laughs> so, a little bit better odds. And my daughter thinks it's pretty cool that we have we took her up on an offer of doing something, and <laughs> she's going to be going off to college, and here we are still doing it. <laughs> we can't stop now. I, I just love that in the time-lapse video that Paul Sonoka took, and we really appreciate him uh, showing that to us. And guess what? Deb just happened to bring in the plant that we saw yeah. in that video. Yeah. Tell us about it. Verbena Buenos Aires. It's an old variety, which is important when you're working with pollinators because they have more protein and more, or more pollen and more of nectar. But I mean, it's a great plant. It's easy to, it transplants well, and it really obviously takes care of those uh, maybe, pollinators. Maybe you want to just touch on that. It's the older varieties, the native varieties, because a lot of the newer materials is bred specifically for color, not necessarily exactly. for enough pollen nectar and pollen nectar. and so forth yeah. to sustain the monarchs. The old variety of verbenas used to be huge, and, really? and they, oh, they were just gigantic and fragrant and mm -hmm. vigorous, and the butterflies, bees loved them, so. Interesting, mm -hmm. okay, thanks mm -hmm. for sharing that. We also want to tell people about the fourth annual Duluth Monarch Festival that's coming up this Saturday, 10 to two at the Copper Top Church, and uh, the Duluth Monarch Buddies put that on. They have a lot of information, fun for kids, free milkweed seeds too, yep. so you can grow uh, grow those and raise your own monarch. Yep. Everybody mm -hmm. that's been there just speaks so highly of that event. So there are a lot of family friendly, great activities you can mm -hmm. get involved with. Mm -hmm. Pile of questions that came in already, you guys. Okay, here we go. Um, Janice from Duluth, is it too late to prune back my hibiscus? What do you think? What, wait, no. now is this a hardy hibiscus in the ground or is this one? That is not. Don't have that information. Okay. Uh, it or must, it must be one of the hardy ones. The hardy ones. The ones yeah, you would prune it back because yeah. it's going to okay. come from the root. Absolutely yeah. should. All right. Mm -hmm. Ooh, how do you get rid of knotweed? That's from Stan in Duluth. <laughs> That's the sixty-four thousand dollars question. <laughs> That's a tough one. Now, if, if you want to make it really tough, how do you do it without any chemical use? Mm -hmm. uh, there are ways you can control it, but I would say that. Um, cutting it back and then maybe a real heavy mat. You can mm -hmm. have to use something like a carpet liner or something because right. it's so aggressive. There's so much wet material there, but 
cutting it back and then never letting it see the, the mm -hmm. light of day. Mm -hmm. Mowing it real tight. Okay. Mowing it real mm -hmm. tight and mm -hmm. then covering it with something mm -hmm. real tight. Mm -hmm. All right. Linda from West Duluth wants to know, how can I prevent my rhubarb from blooming early? And I well, you know, that's not necessarily a bad sign. Okay. But mm -hmm. when she talks about blooming, we're setting those seeds in mm -hmm. seed stock. What bolt. she wants to do as soon as they, they bolt and you get mm -hmm. that seed head, yeah. they'll cut it off because yep. that's taking energy away from yep. the plant. But it's a sign of good vigor and you've had good growth and warm conditions if mm -hmm. you do get the seed a little early. Just cut it off. Yep. How long should I wait to replant my carrots? Replant. replant. <laughs> Are you already <laughs> replanting? Wow. <laughs> We're just planting the first time around. Yeah. Uh, if, if she's trying to grow them in succession, do you think mm -hmm. that's what you're talking about? Yeah, it could be. Or, or maybe seed. she lost. Maybe she lost the, that oh, first crop. Oh, maybe, maybe, maybe. But I would say uh, go anytime. Go as soon mm -hmm. as possible. If mm -hmm. you're going to space it out, about mm -hmm. two week intervals mm -hmm. is a good idea. Then you'll get carrots of different size. There's plenty of time to mature that crop mm -hmm. uh, during the season yet. Okay. Um, is July too warm a time to plant fruit trees? Should I wait until fall? Well, if you're going to take care of them and you're going to watch them and you're going to water them, you can definitely do it in July. You can do it any time as long as you're going to take care of them mm -hmm. and really keep an eye on them. Fall is easier. Fall is easier. And just make sure that you've got a con good container grown with a good root system Absolutely. there. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. then you really have to pay attention to watering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, one more before we move on. And uh, this is from John in Ashland. And he asks, are dandelion an annual plant or a perennial? Dandelion is a perennial that comes from seed, mm -hmm. and uh, seeds. so there's a lot of seed that's kicked out, and it actually is a pollinator-friendly plant. Mm -hmm. the, the honeybees love it. My bees yeah. are all over the Early dandelions. The yep, Interesting. good pollen. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Lots of good information. You guys will have more questions coming up, but now our Grow and Show feature, which comes from friends who share garden pictures. This one has some early season blooms and a photo display from last year's gardens. The tulips are up and blooming in Superior. Terry Aiken sent these photos of red and yellow parrot tulips and these gorgeous purple fringe tulips. Both varieties tend to multiply. And here's a trip through the season with Glenn and Erna Peterson of Duluth, whose bright yellow tulips stand out behind a bed of grape hyacinth. The Brunera come early and make a show with light blue airy flowers. The white peony, named Festiva Maxima, is a lovely contrast to the dark purple tall bearded iris. Lupins in their garden come in shades of lavender and pink. And these are yellow foxtail lilies that front the deep blue delphinium. More delphiniums grow among an assortment of foxglove. The pink William Baffin climbing rose is a standout over the arbor and the coral charm peony splendid with numerous blooms. The South Seas Daylily in a bold coral tangerine is followed by the snow-capped Shasta Daisy. A garage-sized bed holds a stillbe in ferns, and this riot of color is a favorite late summer display. If you have riotous color, fancy flowers, or a favorite landscape design, send pictures to greatgardening at wdse.org and let us show what you grow. All right, yes, we love seeing those pictures, and we have another Grow and Show coming up a little bit later. But right now, we also have a picture of, uh, that came with a question, and I think we're looking down against the wall here on this, and Dan from Duluth, wants to know what's growing along the foundation of my house, and he also wants to know how to get rid of it, but oh. wow. maybe you don't he want to, to get well, rid of it. I don't know. What do we think it is? I'm, I'm yeah. thinking a salvia or a bachelor button centuria, but Would it's hard a, to it's see. It's hard to mm -hmm. tell. Once it blooms, we'll be able to right, tell better, because be there are some buds on there, mm -hmm. and um, so maybe Dan can send us another picture once it blooms. Perfect. Okay, uh, more questions for you guys. Pam from Barnum wants to know, when's the best time of day to harvest asparagus? Oh, there's a good question. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think mm. it matters really oh, okay. too much. I think, um, you know, the stalk is out, and, and uh, I, I think the big thing is you want to over-harvest it, particularly in a younger patch, and then you want to cut back. Uh, about the 4th of July, you want to stop harvesting, but I really don't think it matters too much for the time of day. Mm. Okay. If you're going to keep them for a while and you don't mm -hmm. want to do on it, then maybe you want to wait until mid-morning or, oh, okay. or a little later. 
if you're going to put them right in the fridge and you don't want them covered with water, mm. uh, they'll keep a little bit also better. Just pick them before the rabbits get yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and the deer. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. And they are a gourmet item. And uh, you, when you raise it in your backyard, you don't have to worry about all those issues. A lot of that product's imported, and we're mm -hmm. not so yeah. sure what they're using what to they're treating. control their weeds. So. It yeah. tastes so much better. From it does. Yeah, oh, it does. From around yes. here, mm -hmm. too, mm -hmm. grown locally. Um, Ruth from Carlton wants to know, when should I transplant young pi a young pine tree? It's about three to four feet tall and growing in a group of three trees. About a month ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. as early wow. in the spring as you possibly can, mm -hmm. don't you think? Mm -hmm. uh, I do. You know, we're coming into, into June and then into July. It's kind of a difficult time to move. That's a fairly substantial mm -hmm. tree. So. It is, and the roots. I think yeah. should be much more successful early fall, mm -hmm. maybe mm -hmm. maybe right. September 1 or August 20th or mm -hmm. very early next spring. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Cindy from Sturgeon Lake wants to know about why her peonies and hostas have been so slow to emerge this spring. Do you um, think they didn't survive the cold winter? Oh, I'm sh pretty sure they survived the cold winter. Yeah. It's I think so too. Yeah. It, I, just cold soils, probably. Yeah. It'd be interesting if she has if she has heavy soils. Right. We always see this on clays when we mm -hmm. have a cold year. Mm -hmm. A lot okay. of a lot of moisture. They're very slow to emerge. Uh -huh. And mm -hmm. I don't think uh, either of those is a winter hardiness issue. No, not at all. I yeah. don't think so. Because okay. remember, we had that big snow blanket. It was not a right. particularly difficult winter for mm -hmm. perennials. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of good, good protection. Cover. It's mm -hmm. just cold and wet, and just be a little more patient. Okay. And then Susan from Moose Lake has an iris bed and is wondering. Should I mulch it and with what? Well, what do you think? Well, it depends on, I mean, how bad are the weeds? I mean, yeah. that's going to be your determining factor. If it's ugly and you have lots of weeds, then you should mulch it, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, mm -hmm. we want to say, what are we going to mulch for? Is it weed control? And a mulch is going to do much if you get a lot of quack grass right. you know, oh. or something like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. and mulch will help with annuals, but mm -hmm. uh, they certainly don't need any winter protection. Most of them, mm -hmm. they'll mm -hmm. make it through the winter. Got to so. clean it up. Mm -hmm. yeah. If it's weed, right. weed control annuals, but it's not going to, that mulch isn't going to do much against the quiet grass, then we got to have another approach to something like that. Okay, great. Lots of good information. Thanks. Well, if you've ever seen this garden that's coming up while you were making your way through Duluth, you likely stopped for a closer look. It is a pollinator's paradise where the entire yard and lawn has been transformed. Hi, I'm Linda Heron. And I'm Norm Heron and welcome to our garden. We're here in the Congdon neighborhood. Uh, we've lived here for about 38 years, and, um, but our gardens have not been here quite that long. We started them around 10 years ago. We had small gardens, little patches. Every year I felt like I needed more and more. I wanted to try different varieties of flowers. And so I thought, well, we'll just make the garden a little bit bigger. And finally we reached the point where we thought, let's just take up all the grass do all flowers. It's all perennials and I like to move my flowers around. If they don't do well in a certain spot, they need more sun, they need less sun. It's wonderful to do that. The grass became a dull feature for me. So it took the first year we did the half. I dug that up and uh, the next year the other half. Here I have Veronica, and this is a very interesting plant because as you can see, it blooms from the bottom up to the top, and when it's finished, I, if I deadhead this plant, it will bloom again this year. So I, I love these. And then of course I have the Shasta daisies. Those are always wonderful. And of course I have the, um, the purple cone flower, which butterflies just love. It's one of the you know nectar flowers for uh, monarchs for sure. Ooh, they're called balloon flower. This is the bud and it actually sort of puffs up like that and then when it's ready to bloom it opens up and then this is the result. It just bursts to it. I guess someone thought it looked like a balloon. Campanula is, is a very unusual flower because it comes in so many varieties. I have a blue variety which is more open like this, opening to the the top and then these open to the bottom, which is interesting and more like a bell flower. This is mostly the shade garden here, of course, the hostas and some of the grasses can take either a little bit of sun, a little bit of shade, the lamb's ear. And I love the, about this flax is um, every day there'll be blooms on it, but they'll be in different places because they've got blooms all along the stem. This is the only, I have to call it an annual. My daughter lives in Bellingham, Washington, and at her house, when she moved in, she had these lovely flowers. 
looked and we found out that they were called Love in a Mist or Nigella. And I sprinkled them in here and they come back every year. They're just lovely. I, I can see why they call them Love in a Mist. This is the mist of all the, the little greenery around the center of the flower. Oh, my Liatris, I love these. They, these are actually um, Minnesota natives, Prairie Star, they call them. I also love the yellow, tall, spires of Ligularia. I love yellow flowers. They're just so bright and cheery and, when, and you look at them and they make you feel good just looking at them. And this is one of my favorites. Oh, the, your the favorite. The spider plant. Spider plant. It has those tendrils that come out and I guess that's what reminds people of a spider. <laughs> the bees like it. They, 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 I do have a ton of bees. I mean, in fact, if you just sit here or stand here, you can actually hear a hum. Welcome back. We have much more great gardening ahead, including part two of that tour of a gorgeous lawn-free yard. Still with us are sage growers, Bob <laughs> Olin and Deb Burns Erickson. Of course, I mean, speaking of your expertise. I see, yeah, not, in your not knowledge. age. Sage. No, no, no. <laughs> no, not your age and, and not the herb sage, which okay. I, I know you have grown before <laughs> as well. No, thanks you guys again for being here. And uh, we do have so many questions still to answer and I think we'll just start with that right now. Okay. okay? All right, uh, Joni from Floodwood wants to know, should I prune my dwarf Korean lilac tree and when should that be done? Mm. Well, not yet. Not yet, because it let probably it, hasn't bloomed yet, Exactly, right? let, it, let it flower and then shape mm -hmm. it the way you want it after it's done. I, I agree, and you know, too many people let those lilacs go until oh. you get a big, long, woody stem oh. and then they want to prune them. So mm -hmm. prune, prune annually mm -hmm. after the flower. Yep, right after the flower. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, there you go. Rose from Cloquet, uh, my yard is filled with violets. How can I manage or eradicate them, or should I accept them? I know they're good for pollinators. Mm -hmm. That's a great question mm -hmm. for tonight's show. Mm -hmm. It is yeah. a great yeah, question. Yeah, I'm going with keep them keep for em. the pollinators. I, I was just taking pictures of them, and right by our hives, there they are. And yeah. sure. the honeybees are all over them. So I think manage and live with them, and uh, mm -hmm. I think that's good advice. Mm -hmm. You know, you can eliminate just about anything if you really care to, but we're trying to emphasize be friendly environments, mm -hmm. be friendly lawns, and they, mm -hmm. they enjoy the flowers. So. Absolutely. All right, Keith from Ashland wants to know, are those soil test kits from the hardware big box stores accurate? Well, this has been my experience. I think, uh, you know, they give you a certain amount of, uh, of information. Mm -hmm. They're all chemical based and chemicals age over time. So I think everyone should get a soil test taken from a certified lab, University mm -hmm. of Minnesota, University Great. of Wisconsin, certified private lab. So at least you've got a good base. Mm -hmm. If you want to supplement with, with some of these other uh, kits, I think that's a possibility. But I do know that commercial growers that are really dependent on accurate information s really shy away from all of those mm -hmm. chemical-based test kits mm -hmm. and go to a certified lab. Yep, absolutely. Okay. That's right. It's worth it. That's it your really best bet. It's yeah, worth, it is. It's worth it's the worth investment. It. It Don't really waste is. your time. Just get it done. We both grow commercially, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and I wouldn't even look at one of those kits. Mm -hmm. I pay the university or pay yep. a private lab, yep. so I get good, reliable information. Mm -hmm. Okay. Kathy from Bike moved her daffodils last fall and got only leaves this spring. Uh, wondering, can they be saved? Hmm. Well, I wonder about and the site if she just got leaves because they were planted mm -hmm. uh, just oh. last year. She should have gotten some. If the bulbs were high quality, mm -hmm. now maybe, right, right. maybe how they were they when she moved them? Maybe mm -hmm. they were real small. Or were, didn't they store any energy when she moved them? That's you know, if they too. were just freshly bloomed and she didn't give them a chance to catch up, and they're not storing a lot. And explain that because a lot of people don't realize that you, you're supposed to keep the leaves on them mm -hmm. after they bloom. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the day length signals them to store more energy and to be done. And then it makes the bulb much stronger, um, much more viable. Right. And right, if she moved them when they were weak, she might have some trouble. 
But once once again, if people are purchasing bulbs, you want a large bulb, mm -hmm. and you want to spend a little bit of money yep. because it's false economy to buy the leftover stuff that's yep. been graded out and small in size. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Large bulbs, good site, and they will naturalize. They'll come back year after year, so mm -hmm. it's worth the initial investment Absolutely. on quality bulbs. And the time of digging, you know, <laughs> you're going to dig in the ground. You might as well make it worth your work. Sure. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we've been talking about all the plants we can include in our gardens to help attract pollinators. Some gardeners and businesses will also house bees on their property. Here's one example of area beekeeping. We are A Plus Garden Center. We have around 15,000 square feet of greenhouse space. We have 10 acres here on the highway. This is our third season with the bees. I'm from Brazil, so back there, we, when grandpa's alive, we used to have our beehives. We bought the boxes and I started getting involved. I got my kids involved, my oldest kid right now. Right now we have a total of four beehives. I know that I'm helping a little bit the environment and that also makes us believe too that, or to show our customers too, a product is safe. I like them not only because of my dad, of course, but my kids getting to learn about it here in the garden center. The Northeastern Minnesota Beekeepers Association is a group of currently about 170 members. People keep anywhere from one to 20 hives as a hobby. So Jeff helps us and he teaches us, he teaches my little guy. Uh, now that there's things popping, the last couple of weeks we've had them bringing in uh, pollen from the trees. We have an occasional bear around here, so we put up an electric fence. I've turned the fence off now though, so we can go work on it. We typically use smoke to calm the bees down a little bit. So these have been here since mid-April. Sugar water substitute for the nectar that they're not getting from flowers that aren't blooming quite yet. This frame of bees is kind of moving peacefully. That's always a sign that the queen is there and the queen is probably in good health. The majority of the bees in the hive will be females. They're constantly gathering nectar and they're constantly using nectar, as I said, up to about three pounds a day. When the nectar is flowing heavily, they'll bring in as much as they can and they'll store it in empty frames. Notice how those cells have kind of a yellowish color to them? That's pollen that they brought in and stored for use in raising baby bees. The queen will lay eggs in the center. The bees will put pollen around the, a ring around the center ring where the eggs are being laid and then they'll store honey up in the corners. So the worker bees or the nurse bees that are taking care of the eggs and larvae have access to the nutrition that they need to feed them. A queen will lay anywhere from 800 to 1200 eggs a day. You'll notice that in the center we have an area of some cap cells. Those are all eggs that have been there at least eight days and have been capped off. They'll stay capped until the 21st day when the bee will chew its way out. These are all new comb. Bees when they get bored like to build comb everywhere. The bees know right where the opening to the hive is. They're great at navigating. Another thing that bees collect locally is they'll go out and gather sap from pine trees. We're gonna have to put another box on this. Why? Because there's so many bees, they're starting to get full. If you get too many bees in, then they swarm. They'll wanna go find a new place to live. Honeybees themselves are one of three to 400 species of pollinator that exists in the state. They're, they're fascinating creatures. In early to mid-August is when we'd start harvesting honey. It's just fun. It's fun for the whole family. Yeah, and me and my brother usually eat a lot of it. Yep, they grab on the spoon, don't you, like treats. Again, fascinating, those, those honeybees. And uh, I just want to let people know that there were a couple bumblebee shots in that video, and we know that they're not honeybees, but um, we couldn't resist using that video because of the beautiful flowers that they were on. Um, but talk a little bit about more about the native bees, Bob, because um, really there are so many more of those around. Yeah, I think there's a little misconception. The honeybees are really not the endangered species. They're raised like a crop and, and uh, they will probably always be with us, but it's the native bee populations that we're concerned about, both some of the bumblebees and, and there are so many native, native bees. Uh, I'm gonna guess several hundred in Minnesota and it's the loss of habitat. And that's what gardeners can really do mm -hmm. if you wanna impact this. You know, it's planting those bee-friendly mm -hmm. uh, plants. Annuals and perennials. Annuals yep. and perennials. 
Then the other thing, leaving in a few areas wild so they can right. nest. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of those nests mm -hmm. are down in the ground, so don't mm -hmm. cultivate everything. Mm -hmm. Leave them wild, uh, some water sources, some yeah, habitat absolutely. sources for them. Mm -hmm. So think a little bit about preserving and protecting. And uh, wild areas are important for that and other reasons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Deb, you have beehives at right. the Burns Greenhouse in Zim. Right. And uh, what did you have to do up there today? Right, today I was adding the brood boxes to them because they, they are, I mean, the heat and, and all the bloom and the pollen and the nectar they really start to expand and so then you add the brood boxes so they don't start to swarm. Because the populations increase so yeah, fast. Yeah, it does, it does once we get warm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, I also just want to let folks know about a new children's book out about a honeybee called Emma Bee. Happens to have written, been written by me and illustrated by my daughter Tessa and uh, helps teach kids the importance of pollinators. So if you want to check it out, go to emmabeebook.com. You can find a link on our great gardening website. And mm -hmm. I must say this, even though I was not an English major, I really enjoyed that book. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep, I bought yep. a couple copies for my nieces and nephews. Yep. Mm -hmm. So it's, yep. it's a wonderful Thanks. endeavor for both you and your daughter to be complimented. Very, right. very nice piece Appreciate of Appreciate it. A lot of people like them at the greenhouse. They really mm -hmm. responded well. Oh, to them thanks. Too. Thanks mm -hmm. so much. Um, we have another picture with a question and uh, this comes from Jim Taylor, James Taylor. Okay. And um, he wants to know what's going on here. What is this and what's wrong with it? Well, I, I'm assuming that that form is one of the pendulum, uh, pendulous form spruce, but there's a lot of what we call needle cast. Here's a close-up of it. The needle cast is very descriptive because it actually sheds the needles in the second year. It's a fungal infection that takes two years to actually drop the needles. We've got two major mm -hmm. uh, fungi that are doing that kind of damage. Uh, if you stay away from Colorado blues and you stay with white and black spruce, which are native, more they're native. much less mm -hmm. vul more vulnerable to these needle cast diseases. But you know, the only other option would be to go to some kind of a fun fungicidal mm -hmm. spray program mm -hmm. or stay mm -hmm. with the natives. Mm -hmm. Once again, uh, start with your native materials, mm -hmm. even though the blues are beautiful. Right. right. Whites and black elf spruce are, are beautiful, Norway's mm -hmm. as well. Okay, great. Um, lot more questions, so here we go. Paul from Carlton would like to plant milkweed. What variety is best? Um, and he also is worried about it taking over. Well, and I have, we've done milk, milkweed in a few different varieties, but um, it seems like if you have seed and can get the seed, then they you don't have to transplant them. They have a taproot. It's really a little bit difficult to have success transplanting them. So if he has seed or can get seed and start that way, and then, then he can control it a little bit more when it goes to seed too. Just don't let it go to right. seed in your yard if you're worried about it taking over too. You know, Deb, there have been some new introductions and mm -hmm. I think that uh, you're right, they're hard to transplant. Transplant when they're small if you're mm -hmm. gonna try yep. that. But yep. common in swamp milkweed, one of the misconceptions is swamp milkweed really doesn't want to nope, grow in the nope. swamp. Right, you uh, see it. Both like it kind of high and dry. Yeah, railroad right. tracks and roadsides. Right, mm -hmm. right. Okay. So mm -hmm. stick with those two, common and swamp. And yeah. then if you are going to transplant, transplant early or follow your suggestion, just collect the seed and mm -hmm. distribute the seed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Couple of questions about how do I get rid of, how do I get rid of prairie horsetail? <laughs> uh, that's from Gary and Carlton. How do I get rid of creeping Charlie? That's from Sarah in Esco. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the Creeping Charlie, I, I will just say it's, you know, been a plague in my yard and we're just kind of finally living with it. <laughs> <laughs> that's always an option. The Equisetum, which, or the horsetail, <sighs> it's a very primitive plant and it survives under just about any conditions. Mm -hmm. It's kind of challenging to dig and remove. Uh, you can try altering the pH, try dropping the pH a little bit with mm -hmm. some kind of a sulfur mm -hmm. compound mm -hmm. to make it more difficult. Um, all these plants are a challenge to dig, <sighs> but is uh, that what you'd have to do with uh, creeping Charlie? Though, is to dig it out to get rid of it, and then you know, I know you've said Im improve the area too, and yeah, to crowd it out or creeping well, that's Charlie tough. does uh, very does vigorous. It's very vigorous. It does prefer shady locations. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. There are a couple of uh, herbicides that will take it out. It mm -hmm. is a good bee friendly material, but I know what people are saying. It can get so aggressive mm -hmm. that, that mm -hmm. you don't have any type of a lawn. And then you do have to go to some of the labeled materials, so it mm -hmm. can be controlled, mm -hmm. but um, it's it's a little bit of a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, Richard from Two Harbors wants to know, are lupins a weed or a native plant? Okay, <laughs> so the definition of a weed is an undesirable plant. So if you desire it, it is a flower, it is a native, pollinator friendly, great spring bloomer, and if you don't like it, it's a weed, and then okay. you need to pull it and get rid of it. That's the <laughs> That's definition of it. All right, thanks a lot. Um, 
Minnesota has named the endangered rusty patch bumblebee the state bee, and they've also now passed legislation to pay homeowners who turn their yards into bee habitat. Have you heard about that? That's pretty interesting um, and a, a kind of a bold move, I think, for the state. Yeah, the, I don't think the details are out yet on right. how you would apply for that, but the rusty patch, and I've told my story, I thought I found a rusty patch. There actually are about 10 or 12 <laughs> bumblebee varieties that have a rusty <laughs> patch across the back. So but I there's the, there is the endangered one. Yes, and they're so endangered that apparently I didn't you have one. You can't get a picture. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I got something which I found out later after chasing it for two hours. It wasn't the endangered no. uh, uh, variety. Well, we'll look forward to hearing more about that program that, that pays people to turn their um, lawns into habitat for bees. But that takes us to uh, part two of our tour this week, where the Duluth homeowners are uh, way ahead of the curve with their own lawn-free, pollinator-friendly yard. Neighbors and people passing by, are they're extremely gracious about it, and they say, this is just wonderful. We love to watch your garden through the season, and it changes every month. I look at the size of a plant, the color, when it blooms, the texture of the leaves, if they're big or small, they're variegated, feathery, and I try to have variety. Uh, so pollination was certainly one of the factors. And actually, more recently, it became even more important because I started raising monarchs. I always have some surprise plants every year. They show up, I have no idea where they come from. I think the birds deliver them. Like the, the pink, tall pink flower there, I just think it's, it's, it's a treat. It's, it's just a charming little flower. Oh, that's a philopendula. Actually, I got that from my neighbor. I, um, I love the pink, and I've had to cage my lilies in the front because the deer just, just adore lilies. It's like dessert or a steak, I don't know, for an, uh, a deer to have a bud of a, of a lily. <laughs> These are some lilies, again, some orientals that I had in the front, but they grew so tall, they grew literally this high over the fencing that I had, and the deer could just walk up and pick them off. So um, I thought, okay, I am gonna save these lilies, and I moved them back here. Yes, the entire yard is fenced, yeah, with a gate, so we never have any deer back here. <laughs> We've once had a bear who climbed over the fence, but never a deer. <laughs> Oh, the hydrangeas are incredible. I, again, I started with a very small shrub, and um, they've expanded, and they've gotten so big that I actually had to um, hold them up because if it rains heavily, they all just drop. They're gorgeous. These are the um, Annabelles. You can see there's stakes pretty much everywhere. Um, yeah, especially when we have heavy rains, which we've been having these past few years. Uh, it, it, it's necessary to hold things up. These are, they're actually false sunflowers. They're called he heliopsis. They look like sunflowers and they grow everywhere, but they're, they're not as big, you know, as the regular sunflowers. And those come back and they seed themselves voluminously, I have. Now these are cultured raspberries in the sense that the wild ones grow maybe three feet high and they, they will grow up to 12 feet and we like them as just like a barrier and they do produce fruit it's a bit like a um, thimbleberry mm. oh this is estrantia it's mostly pink although there are shades of, of deeper um, crimson color but this is the pink version and it does spread quite a bit it's it's uh, an escape for me uh, i think of nothing when i'm in the garden except i just love to be out here and i love to look at the flowers and butterflies and the bees and the birds. We have two little signs in the front. It's a chemically free yard, so perhaps this is the result of no chemicals. We have bees and butterflies. I'm worried about how many people have their lawns sprayed with chemicals. And on a day where there's a little breeze, that carries over. And so we have our signs out there that say we don't spray any pesticides or herbicides on our yard, but it doesn't mean that they're not coming over. And that worries me. I think we're, we need to think about that. Welcome back. More great gardening expert advice from Bob Olin and Deb Burns Erickson. And Deb has a demonstration coming up on how to keep those flowering planters full of blooms. We're always concerned about that late in 
late in the season mm -hmm. and you'll, mm -hmm. you're going to show us what to do about it. Trick. All right, mm -hmm. great. You know, one thing I have to say is that this program is so great because of our supporters and we really have to thank people mm -hmm. that are pledging mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. uh, this is truly local <laughs> and <laughs> you could do it live <laughs> and local, right? <laughs> But right. nonetheless, uh, without them, we really wouldn't be able Absolutely. to mm -hmm. do this. That's so true. Mm -hmm. So true. Thanks for saying that, Bob. Um, right now, we have another way to help your gardens and attract pollinators at the same time. It's to make a home for them, and it's really a simple thing to do. My name is Claire Landy. I own Junebug Bee Farm and I'm here at the Duluth Folk School tonight to teach people how to make their own mason bee house. I've made these little kind of kits for people so I've got two different types of wood tamarack and cedar and it's just the five pieces of the house and we're just going to be assembling them and putting the nesting reeds in. So the nesting reeds here I've got a couple different types and so people can choose what they want. There are lots of plants that you could use. I just happen to have Joe Pieweed in my yard. So the first one that I am gonna offer people is the Joe Pieweed. The reeds are not as consistent in size, but it's nice to have something that's really easy to grow. And lots of people have this plant already in their yard. All you need is a hollow stem with a capped end, one bee goes in each reed, so this house can actually provide for maybe 50, 50 bees. Cut it down to size and then just burn the entrances because the bees like to have this sort of dark entrance. Bees are great. The mason bees are really gentle too, so even like with kids and stuff, you can go right up to the nest and observe them and they don't, it doesn't bother them. A mason bee is, it's a solitary native bee. Bees are pollinators. We rely on bees for the food that we eat. A lot of the fruit, fruits and vegetables rely on bees to actually transfer the pollen between flowers. Um, and that's, that's critical. There's evidence of bees declining and there are many reasons for the declines from um, lack of food resources to pesticides in the environment, chemicals. And I think the best thing to focus on is to realize that it doesn't take very much to help the bees. So if you have a little yard in town, you can create like a, a little safe haven for bees. And all you have to do is plant flowers. Don't manicure your lawn as much as you might like. Leave a little bit of bare ground, a little bit of rocks, dead tree like, you know, material. They love that stuff. They'll nest there and then don't use insecticides and try to plant flowers that bloom sequentially throughout the season. And that provides, that can provide an, for a bee population just within your yard. They just, all, all it takes is a nail on the top and it's enough, you know, it's not super heavy. As soon as the weather hits about 50 degrees, you can set it out and the bees will start coming out. There'll be bees, you know, different species probably all through July, August. That's uh, more good advice for pollinators and mm -hmm. I know Deb you were talking earlier about an important point mm -hmm. that Claire made as well planting throughout the season. Right plant your spring bloomers your summer bloomers and your fall and I think it's critical for the spring and the fall spring there's not a lot of not not, not a lot of uh -huh. nectar out there mm -hmm. and in the fall they really need extra um, pollen, no, well, yeah, pollen and nectar to lay more eggs, to store more, and right. to get ready for winter. So mm -hmm. really think of those seasons, because there's a lot of natives in the middle, mm -hmm. but really yeah. plan for them for all season. Right, and good when point. You, when you think about fall to enhance the landscape for our own benefit as well, mm -hmm. you know, some mm -hmm. of the sedums is over the beautiful mm -hmm. in the fall of the year. Asters, Asters for them Asters. and for fall. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. indeed. Mm -hmm. um, okay, let's get to some more questions. We still have quite a few. Um, Norma from Grandview has quack grass in the blueberries, is wondering about digging up the plants and cleaning out the quack grass, or would that be just a lost cause? And then Diane wants to know about cleaning out quack grass as well. Mm -hmm. Quack is so aggressive, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I think uh, actually digging those blueberry plants out is probably not That's, a bad idea I think idea it's a great all. idea. But you mm -hmm. got to do it early in the year. They're relatively shallow rooted, mm -hmm. so you want to mm -hmm. do that uh, as soon as the frost comes out. And then you want to perhaps prepare another quack-free bed that you're going to transplant them into because depending on how you're going to eliminate that quack, it could take the entire season. Mm -hmm. you, if you're going to use it with chemicals, it's going to take uh, maybe two to three weeks. 
if you're going to cover it with other uh, some kind of covering mm -hmm. material, mm -hmm. it'll take at least the entire season. So I think right now you could be preparing a weed-free bed that you're going to move those into next spring, right. very mm -hmm. early. Mm -hmm. Clean out your quack and then move them back into their permanent mm -hmm. location. Mm -hmm. All right, good. good. Yeah. Got your work cut out for you. Mm -hmm. um, Dale from Superior says, my apple tree is visited by cedar waxwings. And there's a 20 there. I don't know if that means 20 of them. But are they eating the blossoms or are they pollinating? Maybe a little bit of both. Right. I, yeah, I yeah. want to I want to say pollinating, but that's... Yeah, yeah they're moving the pollen yeah, around. For, for sure they are certain, pollinating, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. But not maybe in the same sense that a, uh, a pollinating insect would, but uh, <coughs> they're definitely moving the pollen around, so that's helpful. Okay, oh. and then Delona from Hermantown has a crab apple tree, but only blooms for three days. It does fruit, and this has been happening for the last three years. Do I need to fertilize or something? <coughs> well, you know, three days with fruit, it's getting its job done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and actually, mm -hmm. if conditions True. are good, mm -hmm. uh, there are so many cultivars, so many varieties, and some really are noted for retention of bloom and color of bloom. and color fruit, but is actually, I, I don't think anything is going to change. Mm -mm. If it's healthy enough to set all that fruit, <coughs> uh, three days may be all that's necessary. She may have a lot of good pollinators in right. there. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, Ruth from ESCO says that, can the ver verbena handle hot sun, southern exposure in a large planter? Like the verbena Buenos Aires? Right. Yeah, right. absolutely. Buenos Aires. Mm -hmm. It loves the heat. It loves and the sun. There are many the verbena heat. varieties that do well in hanging yeah. baskets yeah. as well. Yeah, absolutely. And they do, like they, mm -hmm. like they do like heat. They like heat. They do like heat. Okay. Um, Alan has beetles that eat the flowers off his choke cherry tree. They're about an inch long, glossy dark green with orange legs and a narrow body. What are they and how do I get rid of them? Ooh. <laughs> do you know what they are? Uh, there are a couple of metallic beetles that are, uh, can be a problem there and uh, short of using some type of an insecticide and that's always dangerous. Mm -hmm. anytime, Anytime you use an insecticide with anything that's in bloom, you're running the risk of, again, eliminating some of the pollinators. Mm -hmm. So I don't have any good advice there. I think he's just going to have to live with those. Mm -hmm. Oh, darn it. Okay. Um, Carl from Hermantown has white pine trees with rust-colored needles. They appear every year, worse this year. Um, what is it? Can I treat it? Well, the big thing is white pine blister rust that we get concerned about mm -hmm. there. But you'll see that. If it's just winter burn, we'll get mm -hmm. some winter burn. And if it Looks occurs like every it's year, it's, it's probably nothing to worry about. But mm -hmm. if you begin to see some of those uh, pustules on the, uh, on the main trunk or some of the lateral branches, uh, that, that's a concern. Mm -hmm. Blister rust, um, because we've got a co-host out there that uh, is going to be closer to the ground, if you eliminate some of the lower mm -hmm. branches, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. can minimize yeah. some of the pressure from some of those fungal spores. Mm -hmm. So prune them, up, prune them up the main stem mm -hmm. as that tree grows. Okay. Uh, there was another one uh, about a big white spruce. I have big white spruce, 4 out of 12, have lost needles from the bottom up. Is that a similar issue? That's from Ken and Duluth. Well, we talked a little bit about sounds needle like cast needle diseases, cast and uh, that sounds classic needle cast uh, mm -hmm. moving its way up, and um, not too much we could do about that short of a major fungicide program. Or would you remove them as a preventative at all to save the rest of the trees? You might be able to, but I, I really think that, you know, these are nearly microscopic. There's mm -hmm. so much inoculum. Oh, okay. There's so many spores out there that I don't think that's going to be a factor. Okay. Spacing might be might be important mm -hmm. so you get better air drainage right. and things dry down. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes we see this when, uh, when we have real tight plantations. Mm -hmm. And that's a factor of, of air drainage, and then the needle cast tends to work its way in. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they're tight. Great. Yeah. We'll tight. have a, uh, some more questions later, but right now, um, more gorgeous garden pictures sent in from viewers from Park Point to Hayward in this edition of Grow and Show. An array of big, bold hydrangea from Liz and Tom McKay on the bay side of Park Point, where the limelight shines in the front yard next to the ship's wheel. In late August, the tree hydrangea come into bloom near the water. But by October, their flowers have turned to shades of crimson. Just off the dock, delphinium, grasses, and yellow coreopsis overflow a raised bed. The mallards are so comfortable here that Tom can feed them by hand. Sue Armsbury of Hayward shares some of the perennials grown by husband Randy, who brings up an assortment of lilies, double shasta daisies, 
a profusely blooming white clematis, and some dainty blue columbine, Sue says he delights in his garden successes. If you have delightful blooms and big bold flowers, send photos of them to greatgardening at wdse.org and help us show what you grow. All right, and as promised, Deb is going to give us a little tip here about what to do with um, one of your large Gangly, annuals. Gangly, ugly petunias. So petunias will always do this. They'll get just too long. They get just ugh, ugly. Mm -hmm. And so what we do, um, we cut them back in half. Mm -hmm. Fifth of July. On the 5th of July, you have your party on the 4th of July. The 5th of July, you need to cut them all back. Okay. And you'll cut back like half of it. And I know I'm going to make a mess. I'm going to try not to make a big mess. That's all right. But Go ahead. But if you take up half of all of the branches. Wow. Just and really, right. yeah, just you don't give have it to a be haircut. Careful about no, you don't. You're cutting. You don't want to be. I mean, you can. I know there's people out there that will not do this. But <laughs> it would. It is much better for the plant if you do. So cut it back in half. Get rid of all the ugliness. Because when you cut it back in half. You cut back half the water needs and half the fer fertility needs. Sure. And it's way less stressful. And you can never get enough water on these baskets in the middle of July. Okay. So once you cut it all back, yeah, just pretend it's all cut back. Mm -hmm. Then mm -hmm. um, if you use a time-released fertilizer, which is just a synthetic, and you can just sprinkle it in on top. Mm -hmm. Because they all get ugly and bald. Mm -hmm. headed up on top. Sure. So once you add that fertilizer and then it will just flush and all of the inner nodes, everything will break and it will just come back to life mm -hmm. and it will go through September then this way. Wow. Um, or else, I mean, you could take your baskets and put it into a bigger basket. Sure. That's another option if you're just not willing to cut it back, but you will be really happy. And I've had people challenge it and do it after the 5th of July and it, uh, the day lengths it, it's not yeah okay. the day lengths start getting much shorter and it just doesn't do um, what the 5th of July does but okay it it it, it you will be so happy with it come August oh, and wonderful. September too now oh, is that kind of a stress reliever for you oh. as well <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well <laughs> After you're just a long tired of watering season, them yeah. you sure. just cannot get enough yeah, water a small in them. Right. container takes so much water so yeah. much water great tip yep. okay thanks a lot um we also want to remind folks that the farmers markets are open for business across the Northland. Here's a look at the one in Duluth on Wednesday afternoon. It's also open on Saturday, as is the Superior Barker's Island Market and several others all over the region. I know, um, Bob, it just seems like there are more and more farmers markets. Uh, there are a lot of farmers markets and it's all good. And, uh, yeah. you know, like in the case of the Duluth Farmers Market, those are local growers. You're going to talk mm -hmm. to the person to actually mm -hmm. produce the product and things are rolling now and it's just going to be great through uh, through the end of the year until mm -hmm. frost and freeze up and into October. Bunch of them up on the range mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And, and for local honey and when you're looking for that. Or, yes. Yeah. We did have a question from Rod in Duluth, where to purchase local honey. Guess what? Go to your farmer's market. That's, right. mm -hmm. That's a great place Absolutely. to get it. And maple it, syrup. It was a great syrping year oh, and uh, a lot yes. of good maple syrup out there this year mm -hmm. as well. And if you have local honey, if you've never had it, you need to try it. Yeah. The only reason I do hives is because I had local honey once. There's no comparison wow. to what you so get in true. the store. So sure. You just need to try it. So okay, true. excellent. Mm -hmm. uh, time for just a few more questions here. Lila from Duluth has a skyrocket juniper that turns brown. What can be done? Will it make it? Hmm. Well, again, that's that's winter injury. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, you know you can prune some of that up right now. Um, you're going to get a little bit of additional flush, but uh, uh, you know we can expect a certain amount of that every year, even with the snow cover. Um, she had some issues there, so you just have to kind of stay with it. Uh, early in the year, a little fertility can help. Sure. In that case, mm -hmm. even a little slower leaves mm -hmm. would be good. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, Linda from Duluth, is it okay to prune back a pussy willow? She says it's dragging on the grass. Oh, sure. Sure. Yeah, yeah. why wouldn't you? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, last summer, mushrooms came up in the vegetable garden. What can I do to prevent this? That's from Bill in Duluth. And boy, there were mushrooms all over from the moisture. Mm -hmm. Two things, moisture, and then you have to have uh, a woody material down there, some kind of... Uh, is in there. Yeah, something's mm -hmm. in the soil mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. is thriving on, because these don't generate their own <laughs> uh, food. They are saprophytes. They suck on the, uh, the woody decaying material there. So the one thing they can do is you can try to accelerate that decay process by getting some more nitrogen 
more nitrogen, better tillage, a little more air, so mm -hmm. you're, you're accelerating the microbial activity. The breakdown. You mm -hmm. break down the woody mm -hmm. material, and yep. that'll take care of your mushroom problem. Yep. Wow, okay, Absolutely. we just have time for a quick one. Mary wants to know where Burns Greenhouse is. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know where that is. Uh, it's in Zim, which um, is just east and north, or west and north of Cotton. Okay. And so we're about 45 minutes from the top of the what hill. What road are you guys on? On Highway 7, 1990 Highway, Highway 7. Highway 7. There we, we go. We have a website mm -hmm. and Facebook and okay, good. everything the else. big booming metropolis Yes, of there's Zim. nothing else. Metropolis of Zim. Really. Zim. <laughs> okay. So. Which is a statement to the, uh, the, the fortitude <laughs> of developing a business in that in the middle location. Of nowhere, yes. Right? <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. um, Want to remind people, please go to our website. We also have an Instagram page. So check those out for more information on great gardening. Um, what's your prediction for the harvest, you guys? What do you think? Oh. Uh, you know, we started off cool. I'm going to predict we're going to end up warm. Okay. I, th I think it's we're starting to grow. We're going to have a good year. We always have to be optimistic. Right. Yeah. And I think we're going to have a very nice fall. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, we do have one more show coming up. Uh, you may recall that we were snowed out in April. <laughs> so we're going to make that show up next Thursday, June 13th. And we're going to talk about growing mushrooms, if, well, the that ones you can you eat, want. that you mm -hmm, want, mm -hmm, <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. My colleagues Karen and Greg are standing by to tell you how you can support Great Gardening and other public television programs. Bob Olin, Deb Burns Erickson, boy, we couldn't do this without you guys. Really a wealth of information. Thank you so much for your expertise. It's our pleasure, and we mm -hmm. couldn't do it without all of our faithful viewers. Yep. Well. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks to all of you who called in from all of us here. Enjoy the garden. Mm -hmm.